I didn't really start NFTs till just six months ago. You are early. So I don't feel like you're too late to the party. You are very early. Uh, not 1% of people knows about what we're talking about in here right now. So congratulations on being very early. Um, particularly for myself, I want to go ahead and just straight up um, disclaimer this. There will accidentally be Cardano bi bias. I am accidentally an Ada Maxi. Uh, feel free to call me out on it. I want to discuss other chains. I want to learn about other stuff. My information tends to be kind of heavy on Cardano, so feel free to call me on that or ask questions or stop me if you guys have anything about it. Um, I guess I is there a forward button here? Perfect. Uh, so I want to start with fungible tokens versus non-fungible tokens. Um, first thing that a lot of people don't understand about NFT is what does non-fungible token stand for? A lot of people aren't familiar with the word fungible. Uh, what it really means is whether or not the token is distinguishable from another one, or whether or not it's a unique asset. A non-fungible token is completely distinguishable as its own item. Uh, I can tell the difference between my Mutant API Club NFT versus my best friend's Mutant API Club NFT. They're unique and have their own attributes. They're, indis they're individually distinguished on the blockchain. Versus one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. It doesn't matter who sends it to you, it doesn't matter where it came from, doesn't matter how many times it's been exchanged, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. That's kind of the easiest way to explain the difference between a fungible Bitcoin versus a non-fungible token in an NFT. Um, NFTs right now, the big hype and the money really comes from JPEGs, right? Everybody's, we're selling pictures of monkeys and we're selling pictures of whatever else for insane amounts of money and nobody understands, surely it's not sustainable, etc. cetera. Um, probably right. Honestly, a lot of this stuff's probably, you're probably right. Right now, there's a lot of money to be made. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, but it's not without risk. There's definitely risk to be had throughout the entire NFT space. Um, there are a lot of people out there who say that 99% of NFTs will go to zero, and they could be right, um, but probably not about what's on the market today. I think a lot of what's out today will hold historic value because we are so early today. Uh, in the future, though, JPEGs are not gonna be the main priority. Non-fungible property is going to become a way where we define property ownership in the future. Um, fractionalized property is going to become possible by tokenizing assets that you own, such as your home. Um, education and certificates will probably be entered into smart contracts by reputable institutions, where they will have a verified smart contract address or a verified what we call policy ID, where you can see, okay, this education came from this institution. They met these criteria, and the smart contract and the code automatically rendered you your result and now your certification your diploma it's on the blockchain it's verifiable you can show it to an employer and say yeah I absolutely really completed this program and there's no denying it whatsoever um, a lot of people don't think about this kind of stuff but uh, health records as well are another really important one being that the blockchain protects your information from anybody who you don't want to see it but is accessible to anybody who you give access to it so stuff like uh, HIPAA or HIPAA protected information um, health records between multiple uh, institutions, et cetera, could have really benefit from putting this kind of information onto the blockchain. And more than likely, it's, it's at this point almost inevitable for the future. Um, as far as talking about actual NFTs that you can buy today and what they really look like, the main platforms that exist, and there are a few others, um, are gonna be Ethereum. Everybody knows that Ethereum is pretty much where you find most of the NFTs that are for sale today. OpenSea.io is the largest platform for actually buying, selling, and viewing NFT collections right now, and they do about 95% of the USD volume for NFT sales. A lot of that is due to the fact that the largest and most expensive NFTs exist on Ethereum because they're the earliest, and early mint date is one of the things that drives value early on. So stuff like CryptoPunks, I don't know if any of you ever heard of them, there's things called Ether Rocks, it's literally a picture of a rock, it sells for $300,000. Um, when, no, it's not a photo. It's a drawing of a rock. Um, they sell for three hundred thousand dollars. So, um, part of it is just being early. It's you know a big part of uh, NFTs is clout or in, you know uh, vanity. There's an industry for it, but it's not going anywhere. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But part of it is just being able to flex and show that you're early. Um, and a lot of these, like I said, are going to become historic pieces down the road. So it's going to be a marvelous and hilarious idea that somebody spent what will become tens of millions of dollars on a rock. It's going to be funny. And the most entertaining outcome is often the most likely. Uh, other platforms that people are working on right now, Solanart or Solana is realistically probably the second largest as far as volume right now. Solana is a really uh, NFT friendly platform. They offer a lot lower fees. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Ethereum's insane gas fees. 
Um, Solana really helps cut that down and make it a little bit more user friendly. In my personal experience, um, I have had a, a little bit of a concern with some of the projects that have come up on Solana that appear to be cash grab type stuff. And you have to be aware of that stuff out there, but it's out there. Salonart.io is their smart contract sales platform and it is fantastic. Um, you can get on there, you can search for whatever project you want. You can search prices high to low. You can search volume. You can search all these different parameters and metrics that really help you sort and understand what you're purchasing as part of a collection. Um, that's another thing that you kind of expect to see on something like Ethereum on their OpenSea platform. And that is a distinct advantage they have over Cardano at this point in time. Cardano is where I'm doing most of my transacting and I've been very successful because I'm very early. Um, but we lack a full smart contract platform at this point in time. Space Buds is our largest uh, NFT project right now. It's one of the earliest. And they have successfully launched the very first smart contract decentralized app on Cardano just this last week. So Space Buds alone, its own project has its own marketplace, which is working fully on smart contracts. And I will say that the volume is speaking for itself. It's working. Question. Can you tell me more about what a smart contract is? Absolutely. Uh, a smart contract is essentially uh, just an if-then function that's written into code. So essentially what it says is asset A will perform function A if these conditions are met. If these conditions are met, then, and it allows for basically decentralized finance to exist. It's the main advantage over products like Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, over Bitcoin. The only reason we're really not all just all in on Bitcoin is because Bitcoin doesn't really allow for finance because those contracts aren't possible. So when you start thinking about, um, you start thinking about concepts like lending, you start thinking about finance down the road, it's really difficult to actually contract Bitcoin transactions. Uh, that stuff's actually directly in the base layer of a lot of these other cryptocurrency options. So, any other questions, real quick, before I move forward? Cool. So, what about the JPEGs? Uh, a lot of them are just pretty pictures. These are a couple that I've collected. Actually, this one is one that my sister and I released. That's a uh, one of 100 that me and my sister actually released on Cardano as an experiment so that I could fully understand the back end and how it worked. Uh, we were able to sell those out in about 12 hours, which was really nice. A couple things that you guys should be aware of though, this ecosystem is developing at an insane pace. Um, it is really risky. There's a lot of stuff out there going to zero. There are a lot of people out there grabbing cash, but there are really great projects that you can get. One of the best strategies for people who are new into the entrance, or are new entrants, is to do your research and get a hold of as close to what we call blue chips as you can get a hold of early. Uh, your blue chips are related to the stock market like your Amazons, your Microsofts, your Apples. You know they're not going anywhere. You know that they're going to continue to build value and grow. Um, there's a lot of that on the NFT platforms at this point in time, and there's a lot of dust out there that's not likely to hold value. Another piece of advice is buy what you like, because there's a really good chance that it's going to go to zero. It's not going to hold its value. It's not going to increase. And you're going to be left having purchased a piece of art. It's going to be yours. So enjoy it. Uh, enjoy it. You know what I mean? So, uh, one more thing before we get into kind of like the blue chip options and what they really look like is art versus collectibles and why each is valuable. Um, the traditional art market is a little slower to develop as we've all seen over, you know, since the 1400s or whatever, but um, there's really pretty, really nice, high quality stuff out there. One of one art from obscure, smaller collectors, etc., that may very well appreciate over time and very well may hold significance due to being so early on the blockchain today. However, beauties in the eye of the beholder, etc. You gotta be a big fan of that artist and there's a good chance that not everyone else on the market will see it that way. There's a good chance also that you're gonna end up holding a really nice piece of art that you paid for in crypto. Collectibles are a little bit more liquid. There's generally sets in, sold in larger sets of 1,000, 100, 10,000, 20,000, lots of them. And when you have, they tend to create a community. Like the apes that I showed in the beginning, Hashtag ape follow ape is all over Twitter. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. If I have an ape, you're probably gonna follow me back and I don't have to, there's no thoughts about it. Build community, we're all friends now. You're my homie because you have an ape. And that's, that's just how it works. It's crazy, it's hard to explain to somebody from the outside, but I'm telling you that it goes deep. Um, so collectibles tend to create a lot of community value and a lot of them are gener what we call generative projects where they're very similar image, like the apes we were talking about and they all just have different features. Some of them are rare, some of them are common. You know, the guy who's got the crazy blue hair, it's worth extra value or whatever. Um, 
the good news about that though, as far as a risk concern, is that because there are 10,000 other people in this community, there's a good likelihood you're not gonna be the last one holding the bag if people decide we don't like them anymore. Uh, so there's a little bit of security in numbers and NFTs, and that's something to just kind of be aware of. Um, so what makes a blue chip project? What makes a less risky project? Um, definitely projects that are gonna stand above and hold through the test of time. Uh, look for stuff like great quality art and immense community engagement. If you're looking for an NFT to pick up, um, make sure that you like the people that are in, engaged with it. Make sure you like the artist. Make sure you like the plant. Uh, why am I holding this down the road? Do I think that it's going to benefit me? Is it going to benefit society? Is it gonna benefit this cryptocurrency that I'm trying to hold? Uh, why am I holding this is a big question because you're spending hard earned crypto on it. And we all know that we think that stuff goes up, not financial advice, um, but you gotta realize that you're giving up, it doesn't may not feel like it, it may feel like magic internet beans, but you are trading real money for that stuff. So just make sure that you're considering it an investment at the same time. Um, as far as what you're gonna find in blue chips, uh, you're gonna find good art, uh, big community engagement. Like I said earlier, stuff that's minted or created onto the blockchain early uh, generally holds higher historical value and a lot of that stuff does hold value just based on the date that it was minted. Uh, depends on the individual ecosystem that you're working on, but sometimes significant historical events can create value. Uh, the one that I pointed out to you guys that my sister and I dropped, we dropped that on the day that Cardano dropped smart contracts. And I personally think that the mint date, 9-12-2021, is going to hold value, just because of the fact that it was on smart contracts date, and there's only 100 of them. Uh, that kind of stuff can play in. Lastly, strong tokenomics. Uh, the same thing that you look at with, with a crypto. How many are there? What kind of circulating supply? Who's holding them? Who are they being released to? Are these people already in immense profits? Do they have incentive to dump this on me? Are we gonna hold this long term? Um, and what do, what do the ecosystems look like in the future? Those kinds of questions are the ones you really wanna be considering when you're considering an NFT project. A um, couple of blue chips that you can find out there on the market right now. These are the big, bad, expensive guys, but um, you look at CryptoPunks are one of the earliest NFTs ever released all the way back in 2017. Nobody thinks that CryptoPunks art is good. Nobody thinks it's cool. Nobody really likes the art. It's they're from 2017, man. You're an OG and you can flex it on everybody with your little pixelated face for $380,000. Hmm. Could be yours right now. Um, Board Ape Yacht Club, these are the originals of the guys that I hold. So Board Ape Yacht Club is a 10,000 ape project. I borrowed this guy from a guy who gave me permission to. Um, that, and essentially when you hold one of these guys, they allowed you to uh, mint the mutant apes so you would get a mutated version of your own ape. And then there's actually a second mutant version of your own ape. So actually there are 20,000 mutants compared to the 10,000 board apes. So the apes that I showed you guys in the beginning are derivatives from the same team that are owned by Board Ape Yacht Club. Uh, the Board Apes right now are going for around 40 ETH or $145,000 at a minimum. The highest I've seen sold recently was around $1.5 million uh, for a Board Ape Yacht Club NFT. DGEN Ape Academy is kind of the big dog on Soul. I really don't mess with Soul that much and I don't know that much about the project, but when you go on Soul on art.io, they are clear, far and away, the big one. Um, so I just wanted to go ahead and at least include them. Uh, space Buds is the one I mentioned here for you on Cardano. This is my Space Bud. I'm very proud of him. This is my fish. Um, he is pretty rare, looking really nice. Uh, but these guys start right around 5,000 ADA right now, uh, or right just a little more than 10,000 US dollars today. Um, they were trading for below 500 ADA just three or four months ago. So like I said, a lot of these projects and ecosystems are moving really, really fast. Um, and there's great upside to be had if you're able to get down on them early. It's just making sure that you pick the right train to go ahead and hop on. Um, as, far as, as far as being priced out of blue chips, uh, not a whole lot of people just got $140,000 to go blow on a picture of a monkey, and I fully understand that. One of the best opportunities to actually make good money or to um, succeed in the NFT space is actually directly to mint it from the artist. So artists generally mint their NFTs for a pretty affordable number. A lot of times they, you know, they're minting 10,000 of these things and 10,000 times 45 ADA is a pretty nice little stack of money. You know, or they can drop these things for a 20th of an ETH and drop a thousand of them and come away with a pretty good little chunk of money on their side. So minting from the artist is almost always the least expensive way to get a hold of a piece of art. The problem is with demand. Uh, a lot of times there's greater demand than there is supply. 
and they mint or sell out quickly. Um, technological concerns on each chain kind of have their own, each chain has their own complications, I guess I could say as far as the difficulties of minting, but just be aware that if you're gonna try to mint a piece of art, there's a, likely a lot of other people who are trying to do the same. Um, the secondary market becomes really hot for a lot of NFT projects quickly. So if you um, fail to mint an NFT, a lot of times there'll be a scramble to purchase them on the second secondary market. Sometimes that's a great opportunity to get it right after mint, and sometimes you're buying a bubble. So just kind of be aware of that, think about it. A lot of times the absolute greatest price surge that ever comes from an NFT comes two days after they were purchased, and then you never see that demand again. So, um, but do be aware. I'm sorry? When you say minting, yes, sir. explain it. Absolutely, I appreciate that question. I realized that I got a little step ahead of myself. So minting is essentially the act of actually putting a, a piece of media onto the blockchain. So you're assigning um, a particular media file of what on Cardano we would call a policy ID, or on like Solana or Ethereum you would call a smart contract address, and you're essentially actually setting it onto the blockchain so that it could be accessed by the public for the first time. So where, for instance, the image of that shib right there, if you wanted to mint that as an NFT, it already exists, but there's no smart contract address on Ethereum right now for it. So that's the act of actually placing that art onto the blockchain so that everybody could see it referenced through the chain. Does that make sense? Perfect. Any other questions? Uh, besides minting date, what actually provide? like if there's a collection of 10,000, what, what provides the rarity or why is one worth more than a, another one? Community value generally. So uh, supply and demand is going to cause a lot of that and a rarity of traits is often a big deal. So like for instance, I'll just go back um, to these guys right here. This face I'm really well versed in them so I can kind of explain it to you. The lamp fish right here is a 1% trait. So only 1% of all the space buds or I think like 111 of them have the lamp fish at all. So a lot of people really like the trait and a lot of people um, will go seek it out specifically, or they'll go find the cheapest one that they can afford that has that particular trait, for instance. Um, Space Buds, again, the blacked out visor or whatever is a specific tr trait or race almost of these things. And there's, you know, there's tigers and there's lions and there's aliens also. Um, and each one of them has various rarities, for instance. So um, the most common stuff generally pulls in the least value, whereas the stuff that's highly rare and highly sought after generally holds the highest value over time. Because, well, right now it's pretty easy to get a hold of one of these. There's 10,000 of them. And there's about 700 of them for sale. 7% of them are for sale. And as that continues to widen over time, you're probably gonna see a lower and lower percentage available to sale for the public. So the rarest stuff you can get a hold of is likely to appreciate the highest. Uh, one and two. Okay, so is there, is there an attraction to an actual ape, or is it just anything that- Apes work the same it? way. So it's mostly about rare traits. Um, for instance, like the red, the red fur is relatively rare. The, what they call the uh, bloodshot eyes are a relatively rare trait for this guy. Um, for mine, oh, this guy right here, the jacket, is a 1% trait. You know, only, only about 100 out of the 10,000 released initially have the jacket that would allow you to get the, the Admiral Ape jacket, for instance. And that, what, one of my strategies um, when purchasing an NFT is to avoid what we call a floor piece, which is something of the lowest relative value across the board, something that's a very common piece. And there's a lot of those. You know, there's usually a third of them or a half of them are something that don't have anything of specific value. When I try to purchase uh, something in the secondary market, I like to try to purchase something that has at least one very rare trait. And that way, if things do explode down the market later, you can rely on just the desirability of that trait alone to tie yourself a price to it. So for instance, say the price of these apes, I'm dreaming here, say the price of these apes achieves a floor price of near 100 E, I may be able to demand a premium on that because the Admiral jacket is much more rare than just any floor piece. So I may be able to near double what I demand for the price just because it's much harder to get a hold of that and somebody else might really like it. How would you know what's a rare trait? So that information is, that's actually a great question. That information is generally published by the creator of the art project themselves. So that's something that NFT communities demand instantly because they want to trade, they want to flip, they want to make money. So a lot, it depends on the individual artist and it's up to the artist. A lot of artists uh, will not drop the information until all of the art has been minted and then 
that kind of incentivizes the community to hold on to it for a minute until they actually know whether what they have is rare. And then a few hours later even, that'll allow the market to settle just a little, because like I said, things happen fast. So within maybe just an hour or two later, they'll go ahead and post, all right, here's an official rarity chart that says these many were minted in each. And then from there, the community determines value and rarity. A lot of other projects will go ahead and mint and that information right up front for you. So you can be aware and you can know, all right, if I get gold skin, I'm pretty much am set. And then that way, when you mint your NFT, you get that sense of gratification right away. So it just depends on the individual artist though, and how they want to release the information. Um, so you got a question as well. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. Is it kind of like digitized, monetized Pokemon? Nailed it. So if you're if, if we're if we're starting really going really zoomed back out, if we look at baseball cards, Pokemon cards, etc., all this is is digital collectibles. They're created by a sense of scarcity, um, and like we were kind of talking about, a sense of vanity and clout a little bit does drive this market. You want to be able to flex on your friends and tell them that you were early, and eventually down the road, there's with the money pouring into it, it's becoming obvious that there will be profits to be had. And that's obviously attracting the masses at this point in time. But yeah, no, you nailed it. Uh, the scarcity and the ability to uh, verify it on the blockchain. So it's like being an unfakeable Pokemon card. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can tell that's a real holographic Charizard. Or you can yeah. tell that's a real Babe Ruth rookie card. Mm -hmm. And whereas with real collectibles, that's not always the case. I don't know how many people you've seen go into Pawn Stars and find out they have a fake Katana or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really possible. You're so on Twitter, you'd have your you know blue check mark Twitter tweeters and stuff like that. How, and that's how we know that they're authentic. That's the real. They're actually the real coming. Uh, that's something that's a great point you bring up, and I didn't include that in in this because I was waiting for a little further information. But since you touched on it, I'll go ahead and kind of spill the beans here. Twitter is working on NFT verification. Um, I've. I've following and followed by one of the uh, developers of Twitter who actually is working on NFT specifically and working on Twitter spaces. Um, she released and then quickly deleted a tweet um, that essentially showed an outline of, a, of Twitter where when you go to select a profile picture rather than choose photo, take photo, there was a third option that said select NFT and then it connected to her MetaMask account and she was able to choose her CryptoPunk and it set it as an NFT, the NFT as her profile picture and like you see a blue check next to someone's name, it created a little Ethereum mark right on her profile picture that could show this is a real verified NFT on the blockchain. Um, that is something that's coming right now, anytime. They haven't really released that information, but it'll be soon. So forgive me if you covered it, but are you suggesting that if you want to be in the NFT world, that you may want to follow on Twitter? Uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter or in not honestly, necessarily you, but, but no, the honestly, world that's world something. Together. If you want to be in crypto, I highly recommend well, that you spend time on Twitter. Is that the, as soon as that pops, all these are going to go up double. No. Uh, not financial advice, my friend, but uh, <laughs> I see I see a lot of upside potential, and there are a few other. I've made a few other investments around that news, you know. And there's it's kind of a classic thing, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news type stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've made a few other reaches and connections, and I've. I am leaning on that news moving yeah. forward. Yeah, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. How, how, but it, as far as a bubble, like where do you foresee the bubble going? Because if it hits Twitter and it say that makes demand go up tenfold, how long do you think that demand will last? Like, do you think this is a fad that will last or do you think these are gonna hold value for 10 years? I think both, to be honest with okay. you. I think that stuff like this is not going away. It's not going away. It's it's too valuable because it's, it's like having eighty five tops, and it's and because it's or a sixty nine tops. There's only so many of them exactly. for eternity. Exactly, and it, and because it's it represents historical value, right? At this point in time, like the people who own these and the people who minted these when did you are buy these? forever pioneers. I don't own that or this. I bought this. Actually, I bought this one pretty recently. I bought a lower tier one of these uh -huh. uh, earlier on back in June, and I flipped it for significant success and was able to grab this guy and that Ethan Ape. That was my big come up, actually. I was able to get this guy right here as part of that. So a lot of people are buying back in at the more rare. Yes, and that's, you know, like I said, I really like to go ahead and um, try to consolidate to the, the highest rarity and the most blue chip NFT projects that I can afford personally because I'm trying to de-risk my portfolio. There was a short period of time for me personally and um, for me personally in the Cardano ecosystem where I was so early and it was just because I was so early and there was such a small group of people and a, a large group of artists that were coming out that for just three or four weeks there, you could mint anything. And in three or four days, you could 5X. And it was, I mean, it was foolproof money. 
It's not like that now. Don't try and go do that. You will get wrecked. Um, you will get but you will get wrecked. But for just a minute there, it was it was pretty much. So the, and the, 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 the image that you made with your sister, you said? Or oh, yeah. This guy right here? Yeah, the one in the center. So there. when you minted that, mm -hmm. how much did you sell it for? Uh, we sold a, a total of 100 of them for 33 ADA apiece. Um, with just marketing off of my Twitter page, and I sold them out in about 11 hours. So we were able to. Pull. Are they worth more now? Uh, they're worth about what they were. They haven't really appreciated much. Right. Personally, I my reason for dropping this is because I was trying to expose my sister to NFTs into crypto. Yeah. Um, and she's a photographer, and she's almost given up on the art dream. And I was like, no, hold on a second, you gotta try this. <laughs> so yeah, that's cool. So we took these pictures. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting. That is a that oh, image is actually my laptop screen and I just drew that kind of pattern on it in Photoshop and then we took a clear uh, tray like a clear acrylic tray and filled it with water and oil and we're able to kind of get, get these kind of cool like swirly images out of them and there's like I said we released a hundred one of ones and um, we were selling them just off of my Twitter page in uh, just about 11 or 12 hours so it can be done um, the problem is at this point in time if you want to become a content creator the marketplace has become incredibly competitive um, I was able to kind of lean on my being early and my Twitter following in order to be like, hey guys, support me. I know you guys all like me and we're all kind of friends. You can, you can give up 33 ADA, right? And they were all like, yeah, we got you. Um, I don't really foresee my, what we call the Fluid Perceptions Project, do you appreciating. For, do you see like celebrities helping to create artwork mm -hmm. to drive the it's demand? It's already happening. Okay. So that's already happening. And, okay. um, that there are a lot of celebs now who are able to leverage their positions and their social media followings, et cetera, um, to, sh to help garnish really large growth in these communities and for themselves. You know what I mean? They're able to capitalize on it and they're able to help grow a community. Um, and I think there are some ecosystems who are intentionally partnering with celebrities at this point in time in order to try to grow at Or, the or even just influencers. Exactly, online. yeah. So. Yeah, um, yeah. There's there's a lot more of it coming. Um, you're starting to see, you know, we're just blatant shill posts from Kim Kardashian. You know what I mean? About uh, two or three months ago, I saw Kim Kardashian West post a, a <laughs> obvious sponsored content ad about buying Ethereum Classic. Yeah. Ethereum Classic, like it's not even a thing. Like, come on. So <laughs> is it coming? Yeah, that's coming. Sorry, I said somebody here is an Ethereum Classic guy. I'm sorry, but like that's not a thing. Uh, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> Any other questions before I kind of get going? I got on a, quick, a quick question. What's up, Jeff? Uh, so going back to like baseball cards. Yeah. Um, so if, if you don't, if you own, let's say, a Babe Ruth rookie card, but you didn't create that, right? So right. can you mint something like that that you you're not the creator? So you can mint anything that you have full creative rights to or commercial rights to. If it's kind of generally frowned upon, we live in a decentralized wild west world right now, guys. You can put whatever you want on the blockchain. Whether somebody else will accept it and whether the community is going to be like, you know what, this is really cool, we're gonna go ahead and actually accept and support this, versus the community saying, no, this is it's not cool. What, it doesn't matter, it's, it's only what we're, people are willing to buy. This is a very, very supply and demand driven, um, driven economy. So if you have the commercial rights to it, you can put it on the blockchain. If you don't have the commercial right to it, there's not really anybody stopping you from putting it on the blockchain, but I wouldn't expect people to embrace you at this point in time. It's, um, this is a decentralized ethical society we're trying to build here. I'm not really looking to go to any central authority to tell you what you can and cannot do. Um, but what you should and should not do is up to you to decide as a reasonable human being. Um, kind of moving forward here real quick. We're almost through this actually. Just wanted to talk a little bit about what's coming next. This stuff is really exciting. Um, OpenSea is the big one we were talking about on Ethereum. They are looking to expand greatly toward retail investors and the public. We're trying to make this a little bit more mainstream and a little bit less of a niche category that we're working out of. Um, part of the, they're doing that is it looks like they're gonna be partnering with Visa. Visa has announced that they're going to be working on a system to start accepting fiat payments, that's United States dollars off your debit card for NFTs, which would lower the barrier of entry a lot to a lot of retail investors to prevent them from going to having to set up a MetaMask wallet, purchase Ethereum off of an exchange, send it off of the exchange to the MetaMask wallet, and then actually transact for their NFT. Um, this would really streamline a lot of that barrier to entry for a lot of new retail. So we expect to see a pretty significant wave of new entrants from that.
Coinbase is also going to be listing um, essentially now as a direct OpenSea competitor coming soon. So they've announced that they're going to be releasing an NFT platform uh, similar to OpenSea where you can browse collections, make purchases, and they are also going to curate it more as a social experience. I think to try to compete more with Twitter, et cetera, in the crypto space and kind of create a crypto social media platform. So they're going to have a curated feed that's algorithmically fed based on your NFT preferences, your crypto preferences more than likely, et cetera. It's all gonna be native in the Coinbase app, which is probably in every pocket in this room almost right now. So um, we're getting a lot closer to it coming soon. Common sense tells me that these two will likely be friends. That's not officially announced or anything, but that's one of those things where you look at it long term, why would Coinbase not want to integrate with Visa and accept United States dollars directly? They already take United States <laughs> dollars right off my, my Visa card they did last night. So um, with that said, one last thing I'd like to just kind of tell everybody is that we are very early um, in the NFT space right now. There's going to be insane development and a lot of the art that's out there realistically cannot compete with a lot of the stuff that's coming soon. Uh, the tech is developing really, really fast, and the um, some of the applications for these NFTs, as far as gaming and as far as utility, are really, really starting to take off to the point where average content creators, myself included, I don't know if I'm going to drop. We were going to drop fluid perceptions too, and I don't know if I'm going to at this point in time because it would it would feel like a cash grab only. I don't think that I have. The ability to create a team around that project I don't think I have an ability to roadmap that project and build value for my holders and I don't want to just take the money at this point in time so that's one thing to just kind of be aware of is realizing what the future applications of your NFTs look like as we move toward a legitimate metaverse economy we look toward people quitting their jobs and playing games full-time and we look toward people getting paid to stream and we look at people getting paid to educate and there's going to be people doing what I'm doing right now soon in a virtual setting and that's going to be their full-time job is to receive pay um, and a lot of it probably won't even have to be physical they won't have to stand in a room like this you guys can all be sitting on your couch over zoom and cover a lot of this kind of information so we're moving toward a lot more metaverse economy and a lot of these digitized tokens are going to become standard currency um, social media and culture brands are going to become a big deal uh, you guys have also probably seen supreme as a brand in general, there's some 18 kid, year old kid in your neighborhood that wears it all the time. You're like, where? How do you pay for this? Uh, they sold a brick a while back that said Supreme on it. It was three thousand dollars. They sold it out in like four minutes. It's insane. People just buy it because the brand has hype. It's a that's their whole entire market. Um, Board Ape Yacht Club, Cool Cats NFT, etc. There's a lot of these NFT projects that are already rivaling them for that level of hype brand. There's already Board Ape Yacht Club merchandise coming out that people are buying and representing and being like, yeah, I'm, I'm hip with this and I know what's going on. And they can't afford these NFTs. The, and eventually, the Board Ape Yacht Club, Cool Cats, etc., are likely to become hype brands that compete directly with Supreme, directly with designer brands, etc. Um, as a, a form of an ability, basically just vanity. You know, flex on your friends and tell them you're cool. You can afford it, etc. Um, and then we start getting into the really good stuff. He's talking about decentralized finance, uh, etc. At this point in time, especially these blue chip NFTs that we've been kind of discussing, you look at the crypto punks, you look at space buds, uh, apes, all that kind of stuff. These are essentially de-risked assets as much as they can be. We're talking about crypto. Nothing is de-risked, and we're talking about a a higher risk asset leveraged on top of your crypto. Nothing is de-risked, but as close to de-risked as you can get in the NFT world is to get to the top tier stuff that has obvious value that everybody's clamoring for. The stuff when somebody sees it, they go, oh, you've got an ape. Um, that's the stuff that you wanna be holding because down the road, those are gonna hold immense value even to institutions. Um, there's gonna come a point in time likely where you're gonna be able to enter a smart contract and collateralize an NFT that you own to borrow stable coins that you can invest in a coin you believe in. Uh, there's gonna be a kind of, it's gonna be like a house. It's gonna be like a piece of land. It is a non-fungible, uh, non-depreciating asset that they could seize from you. It's, it's something as simple as a smart contract. You sign for it out of your wallet, they, you receive 70% of its value as a loan, and in the event that you default on it, it just disappears out of your wallet. They've got it, they liquidate it, everybody wins from either side. So um, this kind of stuff is, one of the applications a lot of people aren't realizing is available, but coming soon with smart contract application across almost every platform, um, decentralized finance and collateralized NFTs are going to become something 
normal people use every day. It seems insane today, but it is coming. Uh, lastly, professional development and education is one of my favorite applications for NFTs, and we touched on this earlier, but a lot of people don't realize that this will become the standard of education. Um, I don't see any way around this whatsoever, because right now, I didn't graduate from Lindenwood University, right down the street, and right now, I can make a phone call to Dubai, and in four business days, I can have a Lindenwood degree that's got my name on it, and you couldn't tell the difference. Wow. And I could walk right in here and be like, yeah, I graduated from Lindenwood, bang. You would not be able to tell. You wouldn't know. Uh, I did not graduate from Lindenwood, and soon Lindenwood will be able to clearly discern the difference uh, because they can create their own institutional smart contract or institutional policy ID where all of their um, where all of their diplomas meant directly from. They'll all mint um, time stamped with the correct metadata, which would include your coursework, etc. And you'll be able to instantly share that with a prospective employer or anybody that you want to show that information to digitally. There's no worries about verifying that information. There's no worries about uh, losing that information. There's no worries about uh, falsifying documents on that information because it's all loaded on the blockchain. It's all totally non-fungible. <coughs> like How about um, IDs? IDs are likely coming. All that, so everything you, that you see as private protected information, everything that you see as important information for your like daily infrastructure to exist as far as I gotta pay my taxes and I've gotta, you know, Pay for my mortgage and all that stuff. There's really no downside to putting on the blockchain at this point. That's kind of the way I'm seeing it at this point in time. Is if you can, um, if you can put the information onto a public ledger where it's protected to the individual, but it's accessible to somebody who's granted access, and the information can be lost in translation, the information can be misplaced in documents. Um, I don't really see any downside to blockchain verifying almost all of your personal information down the road. So, so a few years ago, there was a boy at CBC that made a bunch of the high school kids fake IDs mm -hmm. and here's my friend would buy, they could buy beer anywhere around here <laughs> our boys are the same age and um, I don't think Joe had one no, he didn't. <laughs> but anyway do you see businesses in say five ten years where when you come in we're gonna scan your ID and if it's not on the blockchain maybe it's 20 years but if this, this is where that's going that would be that's the only way you could use an ID whether it's to buy beer or just to, you know, insurance or whatever, you get on the airplane. Yeah, you're you're you starting. You're working down the rabbit hole now, and you're starting to see it's. Yeah, passports. This is what I mean system. by everything. Does yeah. everybody yeah. in the room kind of start to see like all these? These are great examples that you're bringing up, and you've probably got seven more of them, and they're all completely valid because these are all situations where internet security and fraud create risks to the public, and in any event where security and fraud create a risk to the public. That can be mitigated with the blockchain right. freely, simply, publicly. I, like I said, I see no downside. The worst downside of that is every company needs to hire a blockchain developer. That's there are bigger problems to overcome than that. And that's cheap compared to the compared to the the liabilities that you're looking at. 100. Right. percent Question again. Okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around all of this. Okay, of course, time, it's a lot of information um, at once. So and since you touched on the education part, I'm a senior in high school and. and she's Probably going to Lindenwood, actually. Call it a She's got accepted already, and she's an artist. She goes to Grandson Arts Academy now, so she's, um, her artwork has already sold. And the neighborhood, and um, she said that you know she's got a lot of artists that she wants to work with. And um, so as a mom, of course, I'm going to push her into the direction that she's going to be more um, set for life. So I've already got her into some of it, the crypto. And um, so as far as her adding her own, you know, art. What you, you know, just talked about, and where would I even begin to talk to her about that? Or is there like education class? So she's there? created the art. She, she's an amazing artist, yes. I am, to be honest with you, at this point in time, it depends on where you want to launch. As far as like what blockchain is going to be a, a big decision for you, and like what do I want to be paid in? It's going to be a big decision for you and her to decide. And that'll probably be your first step is to decide do I want to be paid in Ethereum? Do I want to operate this on Ethereum? Um, you'll probably reach the most buyers that way if you can market your OpenSea links on your own. One thing I will tell you is that OpenSea being such an enormous platform is it's difficult to expose your art because there are so, it is saturated. It is so oversaturated at this point in time. So if you're going to launch on Ethereum and on OpenSea, I highly recommend um, that you find a way to market your own like off of just OpenSea. You need to find a way to get that link in front of buyers potentially. Um, outside of deciding what blockchain you're working on though, it's really, if you've created the art, 
you can hire a developer to do the rest. Uh, and that's what I did, actually. So I don't have the appropriate, um, I don't have the appropriate computing devices, etc., to actually launch what we call a vending machine, which is what actually the machine that actually mints stuff from the purchase to the person's wallet. Um, I actually didn't have the tech and I didn't have the infrastructure to do so. So I hired a developer. And basically, what my sister and I did is we created those hundred images and I uploaded them all to IPFS which is a blockchain that holds all of the images on the internet already. Um, and essentially when I got him a full IPFS upload document or folder, and I emailed it to him, and I told him what I wanted each one to say in the metadata, and I told him how many to produce, and to produce them all as one-on-ones, and he said, okay, great. And the way my particular deal worked, I don't know, I'll just tell you guys, I don't have anything to hide. Basically the way it worked was we charged 33 ADA per sale. He took 10% off the top per sale which means I never actually had to pay him. So he, the way this works is he took all the images, he prepared them to be minted out of the vending machine, and he sent me a payment address so that when I was ready to post it up, I said, okay, send your 33 ADA to this address, right? ADA comes in, he receives it, he takes his 10% cut, they receive their art, I receive my cut, right? And it all happened automated. So when I came home, I had 100, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, deposits of 28 ADA sitting in my wallet when I got home because everyone that came through and automated took his cut off the top and sent me the rest. So you can hire a developer to do all of that stuff if you want to. Um, it cost me 10% of my total drop and it's at least 50% of the work. So in that, in that instance, these guys, there's a lot of guys out there who are making money doing just that. Can you talk about the um, side where the creator gets 10% of royalties every time he gets resold? Mm -hmm. So that's coming soon, um, and it, it does exist already on some platforms, it just depends. Um, that's part of the initial smart contract address, and that's something you would want to talk to your developer about, for instance, if you wanted to collect royalties on your art. Um, some artists do, some artists do not. It affects what we talked a little bit about tokenomics down the road, because now you're kind of decentivizing your, your holders from holding your art because when they resell, they're gonna to have to give part of their profits back to the artist. Um, but the artist can program right into the smart contract that the NFT exists on so that every sale that occurs of that token forever, forever, they receive X percent back. That, and those royalties already exist, that could be contracted right in, there's no way, that, there's no reason your daughter couldn't do that. That's just something you need to consider is, will that decentivize people from wanting to hold my art later down the road? Uh, or wanting to sell my art down the road, maybe that'll want, make them want to hold it rather than sell it. So um, that's just kind of where you get into the game theory and you kind of get into um, your decision as how you want the income to look down the road, how much art you want to have to produce, what your collection individually looks like. Everybody has to make those decisions on their own. But um, those are, it is 100% a possibility if you wanted to collect royalties on your art, that could be contracted right in. And that's something that you need to speak to a developer about. <coughs> if you're not, uh, at this point, if you're not a Solidity developer and you can't write code, for Ethereum, you probably need to hire a developer to do that if you're gonna work it on Ethereum, so. And where do you find a developer? Um, that's a great question. And there, at this point in time, one of the best ways is via networking right now. This kind of event is where you're gonna find these kinds of people. There's, is there anybody in here that writes Solidity code at all? Almost. Uh, I, I do not write any code at all, um, but Solidity, and Solidity is the name of Ethereum's programming language. So it's specific just for Ethereum's blockchain. It's called Solidity. Um, and if you find a developer who writes it, they, they can basically do whatever you want on the Ethereum blockchain. They can create an ERC-20 token or 721. So do they just basically take your media file and just convert it to the a JPEG or a you know, a, a gift or whatever. It remains a, the same piece of media. Oh, so there's, it really, actually I kind of skipped a very important, this is really important. I kind of feel bad that I skipped this. It's okay. This is important. This line right here in the middle. So the blockchain, we kind of, everybody kind of, kind of breezed through this. Everybody knows that the blockchain is essentially a huge immutable ledger. It's just a big database, right? That we can all see, go back in there and you can find whatever you want to permanent. It's not anybody's. Nobody has the power to change anything on it that's back there. Okay? What you're really buying with an NFT is a, a database entry. right? You're buying a database entry of that piece of art. The JPEG is the same. And really what you're buying is a database entry in reference to that JPEG. Does that make sense? So okay. realistically speaking, and for 99% of NFTs that are out there right now, 
that's the reality of it is that it's hosted on a third party blockchain like IPFS or AR Weave is another one that's kind of similar, basically does the same thing. Um, there are some very high quality NFTs out there and I don't know of a lot of them that are outside of Cardano. I know that they exist, but I know some on Cardano that are what we call on-chain art, which means that the metadata that they attach, the little extra piece of information that they attach to the, um, that they attach to the NFT actually contains the code to generate the image. That stuff is even less risky down the road because if theoretically IPFS, the giant blockchain that holds all of the pictures that are on your phone right now, when you pull up and you see any ad for Little Caesars, their ad photo is uploaded to IPFS somewhere as a reference. And if that blockchain were to fail, <laughs> all of this comes crumbling down as bad as you do for everybody. Um, but there are a select few NFTs that are actually, the art is generated by the code that's put in. Uh, this guy, look, this guy in the very top corner up there, it's called, it's probably called Unsigned Algorithms, um, which I'm a big supporter of on the Cardano ecosystem, and that's exactly uh, what that is. What this essentially is, is a Python, it's a string of Python code that basically says, lay a layer of red and rotate that 90 degrees, and then lay a layer of green and rotate that 270 degrees, and lay a layer of yellow and rotate that, and there's 31,000 of these things that all came out different little color combinations like that. They're really cool, but if IPFS failed, I could plug that NFT on a, on a thumb drive into a computer and it will generate the art because it's in actually in the code. Um, so there are advantages to superior projects like that, but they're technologically, literally technologically superior. So um, finding developers like that is kind of on another level. And there are guys out there that are very advanced. That's what I kind of was touching on when I said at this point as a content creator, it's gonna become hard to compete. Um, because the tech is moving fast and people are able to create stuff that has more obvious value like that. Um, when you start getting into VR NFTs, which we were touching on earlier a little bit, uh, you start getting into augmented reality NFTs where you can put something right here in the room with you you know, and you start getting into that kind of stuff and it gets pretty hard to sell pictures like this. You know what I mean? It just, it's hard to sell the value when people are sending their hard-earned money or their hard-earned crypto on that stuff. So I like to be very direct with everybody that it isn't necessarily easy to make great money in NFTs um, unless you really can market it correctly and unless you're well versed in the ecosystem. Um, there is good money and there is kind of some fun and community engagement to be had in holding NFTs and I think it's something that a lot of people need to become more educated on in general and it's kind of the purpose of it but um, realistically if you're trying to launch your own NFT I would recommend diving into to figuring out which blockchain you're gonna work on and then diving into that blockchain's NFT ecosystem to determine where you can make yourself fit because they all have their own kind of individual markets. And if you try to bring something out on Cardano right now that tries to compete with unsigned algorithms, you're gonna get smoked. Like Alex Wontambe that runs that knows more than you. I'm sorry, he knows a lot more than me. He knows a lot more than everybody, it seems like, and he's ahead of the curve. It's gonna be really hard to compete with something like that right now, so just do be aware of it. I just want to let everybody know I do know a programmer writer that does the on the NFTs okay. as far as the contracts. Love that. And uh, and I'm, my name's Carla. Crazy and blessed. Go talk to Carla. Then. So it sounds like she's the only person here who actually knows a Solidity dev because I don't know anybody who writes Solidity code myself. Well, how'd uh, you find your developer? Uh, I don't. So <laughs> my developer was not on on Cardano. For okay. reasons, so it's a, or my Cardano. My developer was on Cardano. I'm sorry. So Solidity is specifically the program language for Ethereum only. Oh, uh, and it. Ethereum is the largest platform. As I said, if you're launching, I'm not going to come up here and tell you you have to launch on Cardano. Right, if you right. want to ask me why, come talk to me later. I'm happy to tell you about it. Um, but I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that there's any reason you have to launch on Cardano and it's actually better necessarily. Um, most people that are going to try and get started in NFTs are going to try it on Ethereum, and that means you're probably going to need to meet a developer who writes Solidity. So. You, you, uh, did it, you did it on? I did it mine on Cardano. And um, you did that because of timing? And I did it because it's the ecosystem I'm involved in and because I had a following and because it was real easy for me to say, guys, we're all buying Cardano <laughs> NFTs right now. Do you want to buy mine? And they were all like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, it just it just made sense. And I I already have connections with a developer. Yeah, work up time. Yeah. I literally just sent the guy a, a, a DM and I was like, hey, can I kind of have you help me launch these and he, I talked to him a little bit about fees and they were way better than I expected. I was expecting to 40, 60 with somebody. And yeah. He was like, yeah, I need 10%. And I was like, how do you get paid? And he was like, oh, I just take it off the top, it's autonomous. 
I don't have to do any work. Well, that's like, responsible so. of you not to create more, though. Thank you. Yeah, and that's yeah. I, like I said, I am. I know that I could probably go out and cash grab one more time, but at this yeah. point, the that data that I could collect off of another project is not really worth my like reputation in the community at this point in time. I don't want to be seen as somebody who's out there cash grabbing off the community, off my followers. Where do you, where what is your hunch? Where you're gonna sink your next money? Uh, as far as NFTs, yeah, um, I'm still really deep, mostly in Cardano. Um, so there's two projects that I have my eye on, on Car Cardano. Uh, we were talking a little bit about Equine NFT. Um, that's probably my favorite. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of Zed Run. Familiar at all? Anybody? It's horse racing. Uh, it's essentially ethical horse racing, which is kind of cool. So you could mint mint a horse that has different uh, different stats essentially. So like speed agility, uh, stamina, etc., and then it allows you to race them um, and gamble on them, and other people to gamble on them, which obviously creates passive income. You don't have to like abuse horses, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you can breed them, which allows more people to enter and own horses down the road. I'm sorry? Sort of, yeah, and it's gamified, though. It's gamified yeah, NFTs, and one of the big things about NFTs that we haven't really covered that is a distinct advantage for non-fungible gaming is ownership of your achievement. Um, the whole reason Ethereum exists, uh, Vitalik Buterin actually just came out and did an interview just last week, and basically came out and said, yeah, I got so mad when Blizzard like buffed one of the spells for his World of Warcraft character, essentially, and it didn't do the damage it was supposed to do anymore when he was 15, and he was heartbroken, he cried himself to sleep or whatever, he had to start all the way over through thousands of hours of World of Warcraft, and he realized that centralization caused the problem. And that's why he created Ethereum. Like, imagine being so mad about your spell being canceled <laughs> that you just disrupt the entire world financial operation. So, like, there's, a, there's definitely something to be said about owning your achievements in a game. You know, there's people who play Call of Duty who grind out hours and hours and hours to try and get that gold skin on that gun. And then if Call of Duty came through and said, you know, we don't want to make this stuff anymore, we don't want to support this anymore, it's all gone. It's flushed down the toilet and it's gone. Whereas with an NFT, you can own all of your assets, everything you've earned throughout your entire gaming career, et cetera. So as we move more and more into a metaverse type economy, that's gonna become more and more important. It's interesting to me because it's like, there's always kind of the commentary that it's like the wild, wild west, but it feels like it's way more reputable and people are more conscientious and ethical than what you kind of associate with. Maybe so. The wild, wild west. Uh, the wild, wild west. Yeah. <laughs> so I, there, there's risk. It's not It's not all sunshine and rainbows. Um, there are people out there getting rug pulled, and there are people out there just grabbing cash and scamming. So a big part of it is experience, and a big part of it is understanding what you're seeing. And being in a, in a talk like this and just having conversations with a community like this is one of the best ways to avoid that kind of stuff, is you kind of learn what to look out for, and you kind of learn um, what you're going to end up seeing down the road. You learn what creates a... Um, you're going to learn what creates great art and what creates a great NFT so that you know what to look for. Because if you're not, see, if you, even if you see, you know, if you see art that kind of sucks and you see communities engage with it and it doesn't make sense because they minted so many of them, probably a red flag. Maybe you shouldn't buy that. You know what I mean? Great art, hard to argue with. It. If the art's great, who's going to tell you not to buy it? Hard to argue with that. My real concerns are community engagement and the tokenomics roadmap down the road. What are we gonna do, what are you gonna do for holders? Um, what are you gonna do for holders down the road? What is, why do I hold this in six months? Why do I hold this in a year? What's the benefit or is it just gonna end up being a JPEG that I have in this big long file of other JPEGs that I have? So uh, those questions getting answered is really gonna help you mitigate risk though. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, I'm on a bit stick, which may a bit late, but what's the cost of minting things? Is it just the time to develop the code and the transaction fees in blockchain, or is there more to it? Uh, generally, no, it's mostly just fees, uh, primarily. So it depends on how, um, we kind of discussed was my hiring a developer on the Cardano yeah, yeah. side. If you want to mint NFTs, it depends on the tool you use, for instance. Um, there are a couple on the Cardano side, there are a couple of different NFT mint platforms that charge all the way down to zero just the transaction fee is the lowest, but it's also the very ba most basic tool, all the way to five or six ADA per NFT, but allows full control of metadata and a lot of- Have you wrote the code code yourself or anything, or have to look into it, it's mainly exactly. the transaction fee, and how yeah. people on the network at the time trying to push it. So we're trying to like, do essentially a thousand transactions, a thousand tokens, 
it might be a lot more expensive. Exactly. Okay. But um, and it depends on the individual platform and how you mint them as yeah, well. Yeah. But some people are able to mint a thousand tokens as one transaction. Oh. And that's a possibility. It just depends on the individual tokenomics and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but it can be done either way. Okay. So, um, on the Ethereum side, same kind of things. If you're going to pay, you're going to pay gas fees per transaction, yeah. which can obviously become costly. Um, not to say there's no profit to be made in it, but that obviously is something that needs to be accounted for. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions. So, can you sort of like put into the smart contract or put the token sort of a lifespan with it? For eight days until it could expire? Or is there you know, it's a really interesting well, question. Because you said like uh, you could breed them, but what if you have a whole bunch of these new horses coming into the ecosystem and you want a couple of them to expire? Or to retire. So, yeah, so actually, the, yeah. uh, in, this, in that one specifically, um, not so much a burn function, but there's a retirement function for those horses. So in that specific NFT, um, part of the tokenomics decision was in order to prevent oversaturation of too many horses in this league of possibilities. Um, the breeding aspect that, I, that we discuss, in order to breed, your horse must be retired from racing. Okay. So the breeding is, in, a breeding is a, an opportunity for passive income. The way this is gonna work for this particular NFT is the owner of the female horse will keep the mare or sorry, we'll keep the baby. The mare will keep the baby, just like in real life. And the male horse will be able to charge for breeding based on his rarity, skill set, etc. So the highest performing horses, etc. Just like in real life, we'll be able to charge a premium for the ability to breed, and their offspring will create a better lineage down the road. But you can't race a horse that's breeding, basically. Right. And then the, the second question I had was, you don't have to, do you have to make a whole bunch of these in order for it to be something that's a collectible? Like, I mean, Absolutely you not. just like make a one instance of a, one of course you can, 100%. The question just becomes, will somebody buy your one of one? And that's, you know, uh, but if you just wanted to mint one piece of art on the blockchain, absolutely not can stop. You do it really affordably and expensive. Um, the question is, what's your goal with it? Are you trying to sell it or do you just want it to exist on the blockchain? Right. If you want something to exist on the blockchain and you just, you want to put it on Cardano, I can help you do that for 40 cents mm -hmm. right now. I just put it up there, just put your name on it with nothing else. And it would just be title, your name as the author, as an NFT. And I can put that up there for 0.18 ADA right now. Okay. Do you think um, like Fiverr and Upwork might have developers like you have to find a job a person or something? Yes, 100%. Okay. Yep. 100%. And that's actually a big resource a lot of people are using. Um, a lot of people look, are really um, in support of using, especially like Fiverr for developers and that kind of stuff. What is not so, not so um, accepted is buying art from Fiverr, is picking up a graphic artist, okay. hiring them to do your work, and then going and selling it because they could have done it. We could have paid that guy. Yeah, you know what I mean? Question. And like, yeah. we would have rather pay that guy what he earned for his art rather than you just get it because you uploaded it to the blockchain first. So right. um, not to say there's a way to even really distinguish that, but sometimes you can tell. You know what I mean? And like, if it feels like this is some generic art that you wouldn't just hired some guy for, and there's nothing, that's what I kind of mean about you got to make your own decisions about projects because um, there's a lot of little red flags about that. It's like, how genuine is this? Who's the team working on it? What are they putting into it? What are they getting out of it? Where's the money going? Those kinds of questions start to matter. And those questions build community, which is a really, at the end of the day, community is the number one aspect for NFTs for me, is making sure that there's other people who are involved who are gonna think it's cool, who are gonna be excited about it. Uh, because otherwise, at the end of the day, I really, I spent $20,000 and that's so dumb. Like, that's so dumb. So, like, I need people to like the apes. <laughs> Please like me. Yeah. Please like the apes. <laughs> so you feel bad about it now? No, absolutely not. I feel like I, feel like I made it, honestly, because... How much um, is it worth? Uh, approximately a little over 5 each right now. So How much? A little over 5 each. Right so, uh, so about 4000 for one each. About 20000 A little over 20 grand. So, 20 grand. Yeah. We got one more question. Why you should be really yeah. happy. I, yeah, I'm feeling it. Like, I'm good with it. I'm not, uh, I'm you're not hold, stressed. You're holding. I am very much holding. So. Yeah. We got time for one more question. If you guys have more questions after yeah, this, you guys, one can, question. you guys can ask them. If guys like yourself uh, kind of moved on from the investment, just holding crypto, and moved on to this type of, you know, the NFTs for the excitement value of your investment over the next three, four years. Are you saying have I? Yeah, I, guys like yourself and yourself, instead of just holding, you know, whatever cryptos you're talking about in your wallet and forgetting about it for a while, do you see the investment value? You've moved on to this next step. I NFTs. saw, that's a great question, actually. I did see, I guess in short, yes, but not whole, not entirely, I guess. Um, I saw greater, I saw greater potential returns as, as crypto goes up, as kind of like leveraging 
you're per it's kind of like purchasing on leverage. Uh, I can watch ETH value increase while this it, this increases in ETH value, uh, which allows me to leverage my returns to be larger. And that was kind of the initial attraction to it, I guess, is that you know I can. It's like using leverage. I don't know if anybody here has traded on leverage. I don't recommend it necessarily, but if you've ever traded on leverage, it can become very stressful very quickly. And even if you make the right call, if the graph goes the wrong way for just a second, you're you're out, you're bad. So in that event, you don't you don't run the risk of liquidation, where I'm going to end up holding nothing, the same way you do with trading on leverage. But it allows you to leverage your assets a little bit better. Um, but the end goal is to hold more crypto, and the end goal is to or the end goal is to leverage this asset for access to more crypto even if it's not mine even if it's in a debt position where it'll allow me to invest and succeed at a greater level later um, but i have a feeling that within three to five years nfts like this while they're still relatively attainable by the public they're going to eventually price out the public pretty shortly and that's why i'm trying to make it all the moves i can early while they're still there i never thought i was going to get an eight the returns showed up and i was like I, I could not go get one so I'm really not an Ethereum guy, and I don't really plan on tr on transacting with it because the fees are insane. It doesn't make sense to me, but the gains seem obvious just from holding it. So I intend to hold on to it for now. All right, thank you everybody for being here today. You guys want to follow him on Twitter? He's your yeah. Twitter account is all there. Oh, it's on the very first page. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'd appreciate it. You got a I post huge about following. NFTs a lot. Um, yeah, I post on NFTs a lot. I really recommend that you be on Twitter in general if you're into crypto. Um, up to the second information is not to be taken for granted. Um, I really am not a huge social media guy. I kind of got off of Facebook and all that stuff. Um, but I have a hard time staying off of Twitter because the information that you can receive from it is invaluable at this point in time. Your parents are on Facebook. Um, my parents, no, actually, I was at first. My mom probably was on Facebook. Kids all got off. I got, yeah. I don't see any value on Facebook. I have a lot of anonymous friends that I like better than my girlfriends. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. I do not want to talk about how you feel about vaccines anymore. And I don't want to talk about how you feel about the president anymore. I just don't care. Um, I want to know where you're getting the gains. I want to know what you're building. I want to know where decentralized economy is headed. That's where I want to be. Yeah, we're, so we're going to try to do more of these events, uh, hopefully bi-weekly. Um, so just follow us on Facebook and Twitter, too. Uh, but yeah, thank you, everybody, for being here today. I really appreciate the support. Uh, and if you guys have more questions for us or Devin, just come, come chat with us.